The following podcast is part of a certified educational activity titled Meeting Patient Needs Through Optimal Nursing Strategies in Personalized Bladder Cancer Care. Access the entire activity and complete the post-test at peerview.com forward slash VTJ860. Downloadable slides and practice aids are also available. My name is Brenda Martone, and I'm joined today with Archana Ajmera, nurse practitioner, and Dr. Zhao. So as I said, good morning. Our goals today are to bolster your understanding of the evidence supporting the use of modern therapeutic approaches in patients with bladder cancer, offer nurse-guided strategies to integrate these options into personalized care and education plans. We want to equip you with the team-based skills to confidently manage the spectrum of adverse events related to these contemporary therapeutic regimens. So this is just a simple picture, but it helps depict what non-muscle invasive, muscle invasive, and of course metastatic bladder cancer looks like. It also gives you kind of a distribution of the percentage of patients that we see along this continuum. And it's important because FGFR mutations do occur, and this is going to be important to do the testing for this mutation in some point along their diagnosis because there is a therapeutic option that targets the FGFR inhibitor in metastatic disease. So it's surprising, it was to me, that there are a lot of unmet needs in the treatment of either non-muscle or muscle invasive bladder cancer. Actually, only one-third of patients with non-muscle invasive bladder cancer receive intravesical BCG. On top of that, there are the BCG shortages, which have limited access to care. Close to half the patients with muscle invasive disease worldwide may not receive curative intent therapy, and patients who have undergone on a radical cystectomy for muscle invasive bladder cancer often have impaired health-related quality of life and a high risk for recurrence. So we have work to do. We have to continue with the development of effective and safe and durable intravesical treatments. This remains a critical unmet need and we need to investigate and close that gap. And effective approaches post-radical cystectomy are key to lessening the risk of recurrence. Current treatment landscape for non-metastatic urothelial, if you're non-invasive, you have intravesical BCG and mitomycin C. Unfortunately, if your patient becomes BCG refractory or intolerant of BCG, then there's pembrol IV for a subset of patients. Second-line intravesical therapy includes gemdosi, ephedrogene. For those with muscle invasive, if they're able to undergo neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and this includes regimens such as MVAC, most of us are probably giving dose stents at this time, gem cysts or gem carbo. For those patients who want to do bladder sparing, there's chemo radiation with 5-FU, mitomycin C, weekly cisplatinum, and twice weekly gem zarf as the chemotherapy radiosensitizing agent. And for those with high-risk pathology after cystectomy, there's adjuvant chemotherapy with either cis gem or carbo gem, and then there's adjuvant nivolumab. And anywhere along this continuum, we should always be looking to see if there is a clinical trial that patients may be eligible for. Shortcomings in the metastatic setting. One quarter to one half of patients do not receive any therapy for their disease. Post-immunotherapy, so when patients progress on a checkpoint inhibitor, the treatments that they often see in subsequent lines includes chemotherapy or possibly a different checkpoint inhibitor rather than one of our novel therapeutic agents. And less than half of patients who see frontline therapy and progress see second, and even third-line therapy is less than a third of patients. So patients are not achieving the outcomes that modern therapy is capable This is sort of a picture. Basically, it tells the story that not until 
like 2016, 2017, we really didn't have a lot of treatments available for our bladder cancer patients. So in 2016 and 17, we had a plethora of checkpoint inhibitors that were approved. In 2019, ertafitinib, which is our FGFR targeted therapy, was approved. In Fortimab, Vidotin was our first antibody drug conjugate. In 2020, we got maintenance of Alumab. 21, we got our second antibody drug conjugate, sasituzumab. And most recently, we have a new frontline therapy that we can offer for patients with metastatic disease. And it's a combination of infortimab, vidotin with pembrolizumab. I don't have to tell you how important you are. Oncology nurses play a key role in, in taking care of patients and managing patients. We bring a lot to the table. We have our clinical trial experience that helps us facilitate engaging patients in that discussion. We coordinate care, conduct psychosocial assessments. We facilitate communication across all the disciplines, and we refer patients and families to supportive services. And we can do this effectively because we understand the mechanism of action of the treatment. Understanding that mechanism of action allows us to educate patients about what the expected side effects are and how to manage. It allows us as nurses to identify when a patient might be experiencing a side effect so we can intervene early rather than later. Checkpoint inhibitors, they all work by blocking the T-cell inhibitory signal, so this allows your immune system to go in there, figure out where the bladder cancer is, and take care of it antibody drug conjugates. So basically, the two we have, like I mentioned, are infortimab, vidotin, and sasituzumab. So basically, it kind of looks for a protein on the cell surface, and then when it attaches, it inserts a payload that's cytotoxic right into the bladder cancer cells. So infortimab targets nectin-4. This is a protein that's overexpressed in epithelial cancers, and it delivers the payload of MMAE. Sasituzumab, it targets trope 2, another epithelial cell surface protein, and its payload is SN38, and it's the active metabolite of irinotecan. And when we start reviewing some of the AEs later in the presentation, you'll understand why we can see these with each of these agents multidisciplinary bladder clinic. I think the paradigm is changing. It used to be, you know, non-muscle invasive, managed by urology if they had muscle invasion. And of course, obviously when they're metastatic, the handoff to oncology. But I don't think that that's the way we're going to see things in the future is treatments that are given in later lines start moving forward, we're going to be seeing and engaging oncology sooner. And oncology nurses really have a lot to contribute. And we're often the first point of contact. We spend time with patients, teaching them and educating them about when to call us. And we all know how to work with multiple disciplines. Beacon is an excellent resource, not only for us, but for patients and caregivers. And I encourage you to kind of check them out and see what's available. We certainly don't have to reinvent the wheel. So again, just keep them in mind. They're fantastic. So with that, just laying the foundation for you, I'd like to introduce Dr. Zhang, and she's going to talk about the recent therapeutic advances in early stage disease. Good morning, everyone. Thanks so much, Brenda. I thought that was a really fabulous overview of all of our treatment options available in early stage disease. And I actually have the privilege of walking you through some of the new trials that are ongoing and some that have read out in the last few years. So for BCG unresponsive, non-muscle invasive bladder cancer, we've listed here five different trials that have completed or are ongoing. You'll notice some of them are still with a checkpoint inhibition, so pembrolizumab from Keynote 057 in refractory non-muscle invasive bladder cancer unresponsive to BCG gained its approval almost three years ago now, January of 2020. We have a variety of cytokines as well as viral therapies that are really meant to enhance the immune response in the bladder. And then FGFR inhibitors. So Brenda just told you we have ertafitinib in the advanced setting. We're thinking about ertafitinib in these earlier settings as well. So THOR2 is an ongoing study. I think we'll see some of the results at ASCO this year. And then there's 
intravesical delivery of erdafitinib as well. So for those tumors that are dependent on FGFR signaling, this is a really important mechanism, and hopefully we can retain those tumors to be within the lumen of the bladder. And then thinking through intravesical devices and immunotherapies, can we combine these treatments? So TART-200 is a really interesting pretzel that releases chemotherapy inside the bladder. And so it's a device that's inserted, but it's being tested with citrelimab, which is a PD-1 inhibitor, in the Sunrise-1 trial. And that trial, I believe, this weekend is being concurrently discussed and presented at AUA in Chicago. So certainly, really active landscape of studies and new results ongoing that may define our landscape going forward. We wanted to focus a little bit on the ongoing trials as well. This is Potomac. It's a phase three trial that has three cohorts involving high-risk non-muscle invasive bladder cancer without prior BCG therapy. So these are people who have not even had BCG, but globally, as Brenda mentioned, some of these patients are not seeing BCG. And so there was a question of can Duralimab add to BCG induction or maintenance, or is it just as good as BCG alone? And so this trial accrued 1,000 patients it is accrued and we're awaiting the final results. There are additional ongoing randomized studies of Keynote 676. This is BCG with pembrolizumab as well as ADAPT bladder, which adds different treatments onto Duralimab backbone. Other investigational checkpoint inhibitor strategies, this is the Sunrise 1 trial that I mentioned briefly, presented by Dr. Danishman in Chicago, but also a three-cohort study looking at the combination of this device, the pretzel device that releases intravesical chemotherapy with sotralimab versus either of these agents on its own. So a two to one to one randomization and the overall CR rate, at least from the abstract, looked quite promising. So I encourage you all to look up that presentation. Switching gears a little bit, we've just been talking about non-muscle invasive disease. Now we'll highlight muscle invasive bladder cancer and then into the adjuvant setting. So you saw this slide before. We have standard of care treatments that really rely on chemotherapies and then adjuvant treatments, either chemotherapy if people have not had prior or now nivolumab is approved. What are the opportunities here? Well, there are certainly ongoing studies in muscle invasive bladder cancer as well. So Sunrise 2 is building on Sunrise 1 with TAR-200 with citrelimab versus concurrent chemoradiation, thinking about whether we can get patients to keep their bladders longer. So the bladder intact event-free survival is that primary endpoint. There's also some trimodality approaches of immunotherapies with chemotherapies in addition to radiation. And then we also have some ongoing trials looking at different combinations in this setting, trying to help patients preserve their bladder. Otherwise, neoadjuvant studies of note, EV103, it was a very large study that had multiple cohorts. I think they're through cohort L at this point. But cohort H was a neoadjuvant infortimab vedotin study looking at EV in the early setting. We know EV is good in the advanced setting. Why not use it earlier? With the primary endpoint of pathologic complete response. And you'll see here, this was presented about a year ago now, but pathologic CR rate of 36% and a pathological downstaging rate of 50%. So certainly in Fortimavidotin has activity outside of the bladder, but it also has activity within the bladder, which is really great for patients. All right. How about neoadjuvant immunotherapy for muscle invasive bladder cancer? In this setting, we think about cisplatin eligibility as based on patients' renal clearance, their hearing, their functional status, and any baseline neuropathy. But for cisplatin eligible patients, these are ongoing trials. Energize is adding nivolumab to gemcitabine with cisplatin. Niagara adds sorvalumab to gemcitabine and cisplatin. And then Kino 866 adds pembrolizumab to gemcitabine and cisplatin. So all of these trials are fully accrued. The only one that's ongoing is Keynote B15 or EV304. This is a combination of pembrolizumab with infortimabidotin, and we're using it in upfront muscle invasive bladder cancer. Certainly lots of trials to keep an eye on in the next year or two as they start to be read out. We talked about cisplatin ineligible. These are cisplatin ineligible studies. And in these cases, oftentimes we're relying on carboplatin as our cisplatin substitute and also with gemcitabine. But sometimes patients do not receive chemotherapy at all upfront because of their functional status and they're not so eligible to tolerate chemotherapy. And so in this setting, we have several trials ongoing also adding on immunotherapies in this earlier disease setting. So Keynote 905 or EV303 is a 
combination of pembrolizumabit and fortimabidotin for the cisplatin ineligible patient population. Volga is a trial of doralimab, tremelimumab, and fortimabidotin. Tremelimumab is uh, the CTLA-4 inhibitor, so it's really adding in more checkpoint in a blockade in addition to the doralimab and then adding in infortimab. And then Sunrise-4 is the TAR-200 and sachalimab also in this cisplatin ineligible patient population. There are also some adjuvant muscle-invasive bladder cancer trials with uh, checkpoint inhibitors. Two of these have read out. One of them was negative in bigger O10, randomizing between atezolizumab and observation. Checkmate 274 was actually positive in this patient population, randomizing between nivolumab and placebo. Primary endpoint of disease-free survival was met, and so the FDA approved this treatment in the adjuvant setting in August of 2021. So we've had about a year and a half now, and you'll probably see many patients on nivolumab in the adjuvant setting and standard practice now. And then Ambassador is fully accrued. It was randomized against pembrolizumab versus observation, a trial done in the cooperative group setting, and we are awaiting results of Ambassador. This is the high-level results of Checkmate 274 with adjuvant nivolumab. And the intention to treat patient population, median disease-free survival was improved from 10.9 months in the placebo cohort to 22 months in the patients treated with nivolumab. So certainly an increase in patients delaying their disease recurrence. And we were still awaiting overall survival. They'll hear critique about the study as we haven't reached overall survival yet, but we will get there soon. All right, and with that, I'll turn this over to Archana Ajmera at UCSD. Wonderful. Thanks, Tian, and thanks, everyone, for having me today. So I want to take some time, and we won't spend a lot here, because I know that folks are pretty familiar now with immune checkpoint inhibitors. We use it a lot in GU malignancies, but I do want to highlight kind of some of the key things to think about in terms of AEs. So we know that the mechanism of action of immune checkpoint inhibitors can really affect any organ system of the body, but there are kind of the most common ones that we see, including dermatologic. GI, endocrine, and potentially pulmonary. So, you know, in dermatologic, we can see rashes or pruritus. These are very manageable generally. GI symptoms can include diarrhea, nausea, vomiting. And then under here, you can see hepatitis is sort of in this bucket, which is also one of our other common ones. Endocrinopathy, specifically hypothyroidism, and then potentially pneumonitis. So I think when we talk about education with patients and their families, I think this is a key point, and I really love this graph, and I often share this with patients as well, but really trying to highlight the fact that this is very different from chemo, and maybe they've had experience with chemotherapy, but the onset of symptoms is quite different when we talk about immune checkpoint inhibitors. So, you know, typically patients aren't really experiencing symptoms right away as soon as they get chemo. It's not that cyclic symptomatology that they experience, but rather sort of this delayed tox. And you can see in this graph, it really highlights the fact that skin tox generally happens early on after a dose or two, and then we can start to see some of the later toxicities like colitis, hepatitis, pneumonitis, and certainly the endocrinopathies can cross that whole spectrum. So when we talk about grading and overall management, you know, this is something that I think is a great resource for those of us that do clinical trials frequently. We're very familiar with grading or the CTCAE grading criteria, but it's a great tool to utilize as a nurse because as you're talking to a patient, you're triaging them on the phone, you can think about, okay, well, where does this patient really fall? And you can quantify things like bowel movements, like how many bowel movements are you having above your baseline? And I think that's critical when you're translating this information to the providers because then we can decide, you know, what intervention really needs to happen. Is this so severe that we need to hold therapy? Is it mild? Is it grade one? So generally for grade one toxicities, with the exception of neurologic or hematologic cardiac toxicities, generally we can treat through, you know, we can continue on the checkpoint inhibitor and potentially monitor and manage. But when we start to talk about, you know, grade two, three, and four, things get a little bit more complicated. We may have to hold therapy. We may need to start steroids. And so really kind of trying to distill down with the patient, how severe their toxicity actually is, is a really critical component for us as nurses. 
So this is a little bit more specific, and you know, there's a lot of words on the slide, so I'm not going to kind of go through everything in detail here, but what I do want to highlight is based on the different type of toxicity, so if it's GI, if it's endocrine, if it's dermatologic, you can see that the grading and the intervention associated with that grading can be different. So grade one for every toxicity management is not the same, right? So for grade one dermatologic, we can treat through, we can optimize topical corticosteroids, oral antihistamines, and emollients and things like that. Whereas for, you know, grade one GI, you may want to consider holding. It just kind of depends on the situation, but you know, you really want to optimize their antidiarrheals. But as soon as we start to get into grade two, that's really an indication to start steroids and hold their immune checkpoint inhibitor for any kind of colitis type symptoms. Whereas dermatologic, we may be able to get away with continuing on. Similarly, with endocrinopathies, you can see if patients are asymptomatic, but they have an elevated TSH and their T4 is normal, we can continue checkpoint inhibitor. But if they're clinically hypothyroid, they're symptomatic, then that's where we can consider, you know, an endocrine consult, but we can still potentially treat through if we can normalize their TSH. We know that that takes time, but as long as we're intervening, we can potentially treat through this. So NCCN has really great guidelines for management of these toxicities, so I encourage all of you to take a look at those guidelines as you're talking and grading AEs with patients. Thank you. We're going to do a case now. So Kevin has muscle invasive bladder cancer. He is 56, working full time. Cystoscopy and imaging are consistent with a bladder mass at the anterior bladder wall. He's diagnosed with clinically localized muscle invasive bladder cancer. Unfortunately, his creatinine is less than 60 mils per minute, so he's not eligible for cisplatinum. He is interested in a clinical trial. So Dr. Zhang, what approach Coaches are helpful when discussing clinical trials with patients and supporting shared decision-making conversations. Sure. This conversation comes up not infrequently in my clinic, and you know, often we're starting with the standards. So what is available to this patient in the standard setting? What could they receive with a creatinine clearance borderline? If we're declaring him cisplatin ineligible, then sometimes we're thinking about carboplatin-based chemotherapies. We might be thinking, if he was older, about chemoradiation approaches. But if it's a young patient who's otherwise wanting to receive very aggressive care, then they probably are motivated to get treatment early and systemic treatments prior to cystectomy. And so understanding, I think, at baseline what standard care is, is very important. And then we layer that discussion with, okay, so this is what's standard. And on these trials, many of these are randomized trials, So, and many of them are randomized against standard of care. So then what's the option on the trial and what might they be randomized to? So understanding that approach as well. Many of our patients, when they hear randomized, they're afraid of potentially placebos and not getting standard treatment. So it's most of these trials are phase two, phase three, and many of them are ongoing in terms of building on standard of care approaches and comparing novel combinations with standard chemotherapies. And so I think that's really important. So we set the stage with understanding what's standard and then the trials are building on that. And we talk through each of them that are potentially open at our sites and discuss you know, what the implications of the combinations are what the cohorts are and see if the patient's interested. Thank you. So the patient actually is going to be treated with IO therapy, and we just heard from Arjana about that. But what specifically, if you could name like your top three, I know this isn't easy, but like your top three takeaways for somebody who's considering IO and when to call or, you know, things like that. Yeah, so I think big take-home points with IO therapy is one, early detection is key right? So call for any symptom that's a departure from your normal. And I think this is a really, really critical component of patient education that you know, the nurses are really the front line. They're the people that are answering the phone potentially as triage nurses or in the clinics talking to the patient first, but you're the front line. And so talking to the patient, trying to understand, well, what was your baseline and where are you now? And But report anything. And then you allow us as the care team to tease out whether or not that's something significant that we need to intervene on. So I would say that's one, early detection. Two is, you know, kind of talking about the most common, right? So skin toxicity, GI toxicity, liver, you know, hepatitis and endocrinopathies, kind of the four highest, you know, or most common things that we see and really honing in on those. And then I think, you know, just that highlighting that immunotherapy is really different, right? That symptoms can occur at any time. 
It's not the same as chemo, where some of these patients may have had, I guess in this particular case, we're not talking about somebody who's had chemotherapy before necessarily, but traditionally when people think about cancer therapy, they think chemotherapy. So really trying to re-educate our patient population about how immunotherapy is different. Thank you. Yeah. I wanted to, again, circle back. Beacon, again, has a really great wealth of knowledge regarding clinical trials and and tools to help support your patient. So, you know, if you do want to have some resources or you're, you know, just interested, please check it out because this can be very helpful. As I mentioned before, and we are all very familiar, that it takes a multidisciplinary collaboration and effort to care for these patients. And as we've heard about the the myriad of side effects and toxicities that can happen with IO therapy, it's really important that we establish these relationships with other specialties, not just medical oncology, radiation, path in GU or, or pharmacists, but also those other providers such as endocrine, derm, ophthalmology, you know, having a short way to access them. So that way, when patients do need to have their another provider added to their team to help manage these events, we have everything in place so it seems seamless for the patient and less stressful. So shared decision-making, what is that? And why should we do it? So shared decision-making is basically, it's a process and it's a discussion between the patient and the caregiver. So again, it's a discussion, not a lecture. And it's between the patient and the caregiver and the patient is first. And basically it's to review and discuss the options for their treatments and help select and choose a treatment that aligns with what the patient wants most. And again, that's the presentation of information, the pros, the cons, and those things so that patients can make an informed decision. It can actually break down some of the unseen benefits. Not only are patients more engaged in their treatment and have more psychological well-being and less stressors, but it also could break down some barriers to care. And it also, in a way, could improve certain costs that are related to care. And so all of these are important when taking care of the patient. So I'm going to quickly present Mark. This is a case that I want you to think about when we hear some of the presentations coming next. Mark is a patient with metastatic urothelial carcinoma. He presented with hematuria, had a bladder mass, underwent urine cytology and a TURBT, diagnosed with urothelial carcinoma. Staging scans showed that he had some pelvic and retroperitoneal adenopathy. So unfortunately, he is stage four metastatic. Kratin clearance is 50. He has ECOG-1, current smoker. He has type 2 diabetes, hypertension, and some mild anemia. No autoimmune disease, not on any steroids. And his pdl one status is low. And NGS was sent for his tumor to look for that FGFR mutation. So I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Zhang again, and she's going to talk about recent therapeutic advances across metastatic disease. Thanks, Brenda. All right. In metastatic disease, so turning our attention now to a very advanced disease, patients who have had cancer spread outside of their bladder, we've seen many trials read out in this in the advanced setting, and many of these have built on the early successes of immune checkpoint inhibitors. So we had approvals for many of these agents based on phase two studies from accelerated approvals. And so many of these were definitive and registrational to try to use these treatments in the advanced setting and to think about whether they would add to our standard chemotherapy agents. So Invigor 130, as you see, was adding a tezolizumab to chemotherapy compared with a tezomonotherapy and, and then also chemo. Danube was a trial comparing the Dervalumab and Tremolimumab with Dervalumab alone, and the third cohort was treated with chemotherapy. Keynote 361 compared the combination Pembrolizumab with chemotherapy with Pembrolizumab monotherapy versus chemotherapy. And all of three of these trials, with the exception of in Vigor 130, the progression-free survival was met, but all of these trials were ultimately read out negative for overall survival endpoints. And so, interestingly to, I think, many in the field, and when we add checkpoint inhibitors up front to chemotherapy, it doesn't seem to benefit patients as much as just getting them all on chemo. Chemo alone represents a very good option currently for patients with metastatic disease. Then Javelin Bladder 100 came around a few years ago now, and this is a trial that enrolled 
enrolled patients who had stable disease or responded to their early chemotherapy and subsequently randomized them to maintenance of Elimab, so Elimab given in the post-chemo setting versus best standard of care. And this trial met an overall survival endpoint with a hazard ratio of 0.76. And so that's what we've taken into our practice. Many times our patients are completing a course of chemotherapy, they're having some stability or response, and then we're maintaining those responses with the Avalumab PD-L1 inhibition. What other trials are there in this setting? The phase 3 Nile trial is ongoing, planned to accrue more than 1,200 patients, and this is adding Dervalimab to platinum-based chemotherapy compared with Dervalimab, Tremolimumab, and platinum-based chemo versus the backbone of platinum-based chemotherapy alone. Primary endpoints are around overall survivals, particularly in the patient population that are pdl one high, but then also for intention to treat patient populations. All right, switching gears a little bit, Brenda told you a little bit about the mechanism of sasituzumab govatecan. This is an antibody drug conjugate that targets a cell surface ligand called trope 2. It's highly expressed in patients with bladder cancer, and it delivers almost a chemotherapeutic. It's called SN38. This is the metabolite of irinotecan. Those of you in the infusion clinics will remember irinotecan as an agent we use a lot in GI cancers. This is the same metabolite, so very similar side effects and adverse events when we give sasituzumab govatecan. This was the initial phase two trial showing an objective response rate of 27% in the swimmer's plot, 5% of whom had complete responses, and the median duration of response was about seven months. The tropix 4 trial is the phase three trial of sasituzumab govatecan, and that one is ongoing. It's comparing sasituzumab govatecan versus physician's choice chemotherapy in the advanced setting. We alluded to enfortumab adotin and how effective it is in the advanced setting earlier. This is the trial that compared enfortumab adotin with chemotherapy in the advanced refractory setting for second-line metastatic urothelial cancer. And you'll see that enfortumab improved overall survival from about nine months with chemotherapy to about 13 months with enfortumab adotin. And so very importantly, establishing enfortumab adotin in refractory disease as a monotherapy. 41% objective response responses and 24-month outcomes continue to support that early look and benefit. So if we are thinking about enfortumab adotin in the refractory setting, why not move it into frontline settings? Two separate cohorts have now shown the efficacy of enfortumab adotin with pembrolizumab. And most recently, the enfortumab, the EV103 cohort K, we talked about cohort H before, this is cohort K. So cohort K enrolled patients who are frontline metastatic urothelial cancer and were cisplatin ineligible. They were randomized to receiving enfortumab adotin with pembrolizumab versus enfortumab Vedotin alone. You see here about 150 patients randomized, and in the combination cohort, importantly, 65% objective responses. And if you add in the disease control rate in that waterfall plot, you see that about 90% or more of these patients have stable disease or better at the time of this particular data cutoff. Median progression free survival was actually not reached in the combination cohort, and 80% of these patients were alive at 12 months. So, certainly a very promising strategy. This forms the basis for phase 3 EV302 trial um, currently underway. It's fully accrued with enfortumab adotin and pembrolizumab versus chemotherapy in the frontline setting. And I would say that unlike the checkpoint inhibitor trials that we looked at before, this particular combination and the, what efficacy we're seeing really has the potential to challenge chemotherapy in the frontline setting. So thinking through biomarkers, so are these biomarkers helpful for us? Are they predictive or are they prognostic in metastatic urothelial cancer? When are we using PD-L1, which we often use in lung cancer, for example? The Prevail biomarker study was set up to look at patients specifically with PD-L1, high or low, tumor tissue TMB, tumor mutational burden, how much mutations that these tumors have picked up, and as well as circulating tumor DNA and other blood circulating level analyses for outcomes. And so when we're seeing these, the pd one prevalence in Prevail was quite high. It's about 55% of these patients with pd one positive disease versus in the clinical trials. So thinking about Prevail as a more of a real-world patient population, we're seeing similar pd one positivity compared to the phase three trials. 
So are they predictive or prognostic? This is a progression-free survival curve of the HRR altered patient population enrolled to the phase 2 BIU trial, Durvalumab and Olaparib. This particular analysis is focusing more on the homologous recombination altered subgroup. And in that patient population, we know them to be sensitive to PARP inhibitors, the Olaparib component. And so when you see here, the Durvalumab with Olaparib combination certainly separated in this cohort compared to Durvalumab. MAB alone. And so homologous recombination defects certainly put patients at higher sensitivity for any combinations that are adding in PARP inhibitors. And it's not a surprise in this case that the combination with Olaparib did better with higher progression-free survival around 5.6 months. How about FGFRs? So we talked a little bit. Brenda introduced um, Erdafitinib to you earlier as the treatment that we use for FGFR3 altered patients now. This is the trial that gained Erdafitinib its accelerated approval, BLC 2001, enrolling patients with metastatic urothelial cancer who had progression of disease on prior chemotherapy and enrolled them specifically those with FGFR fusions or mutations to Erdafitinib starting at the 8 milligrams daily dose and treated them until progressive disease. Objective responses was the primary endpoint of this phase two trial. There were 101 patients. 40% of them had objective responses. Some of them had really significant responses, even large masses in their tumors, in their livers. If you look at Arlene Sivkaraki's first discussion of this trial at ASCO a few years ago, there were these very large liver mets that responded very nicely to ertafitinib. So certainly an active agent for patients who have FGFR3 or FGFR2 activating mutations or fusions. And there's a number of them that these tumors are highly driven through the FGFR receptor. How about combining FGFR inhibitors? We like to combine agents that are active. The phase 2 NORSE trial as a combination approach with ertafitinib with citrelimab. We mentioned this one earlier as a PD-1 inhibitor. Primary objectives here was objective responses, and you see the objective response from the initial data presentation of 19 patients treated with the combination with 68% objective responses. 21% of them had complete responses, so very interesting and notable. There is a follow-up for NORSE coming up at ASCO this year, so be sure to look at that. Artrana, we'll pass it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much for that overview. I mean, as you can see, there's just so much happening in, you know, the clinical trial space. And to Dr. Zhang's earlier point, you know, we're moving all these therapies early and earlier. So as nurses, we're going to be seeing and having to have these conversations with patients about all these different types of targets and therapeutics. So it's really great that we have opportunities like this to provide some education around it. So when we talk about the role of the nurses, when we think about the therapeutics, you know, shared decision making, we spend some time talking about that, but really our role is to spend time educating the patient. You know, once the treatment options are laid out, like, what is the schedule like? What is the toxicity like? Are these aligned with the goals that you have? Providing them with the resources and tools to equip them to be successful through whatever therapy they elect to proceed with. Educating them about safety and monitoring. How do we monitor? What do we need to do? What kind of laboratory tests do we need to do? How frequently are they going to be coming in? What type of proactive things can we be doing to mitigate some of these AEs and symptoms? And then therapeutic management. What can they expect in terms of how we're going to assess the benefit from the therapy? And providing support and engaging with a multidisciplinary team. So whether it's nutrition support or a consulting service, endocrinology, or another care coordination for support at home. And then addressing any concerns. So, you know, when it comes to clinical trials, sort of trying to help expel the myths around clinical trials that Dr. Zhang was talking about. These aren't all placebo trials. You are going to get therapy. You're not being tested on and really providing some education around what is a clinical trial. And that actually, this is just expanding our arsenal of drugs that we have access to for a very complicated advanced disease and identifying any barriers to treatment. So what do we think about in terms of safety during antibody drug conjugate infusions itself? And I know we have some infusion nurses here in the room and so may have some experience with this and have seen this, but one of the things that we think about are infusion-specific or infusion-related reactions. So they're rare, but they do happen. And, you know, with EV, we've seen some extravasations happen, so kind of paying attention to your access site. These patients are also probably on long-term therapy, so these may be 
good candidates for port cath So something as infusion nurses and clinic nurses or triage nurses that you want to assess for. Hypersensitivity reactions can happen within the first 24 hours of infusion of sacatuzumab. That's the SG. It could be mild, but it could be severe. So we often will pre-medicate with H1 and H2 blockers and then, you know, treat with rescue medications as needed. And then we monitor these patients very closely following the infusion for at least 30 minutes. So we're pretty familiar with some of that even from our chemotherapy experience. So what are the factors that influence the choice of ADC, or antibody drug conjugate, in the post-platinum, post-immune checkpoint setting? So when we compare EV and sacatuzumab, you can see the dosing schedule is slightly different. With EV, we have a little bit of flexibility. You could do three doses in a 28-day cycle, or you could do two in a 21-day cycle. Sacatuzumab is given as two doses in a 21-day cycle. So this is, again, something to think about when you're educating your patients, because this is ongoing therapy, right? This is in the metastatic setting. This is in the refractory setting. So these patients are going to stay on this therapy. So does this work with your lifestyle, right? And how can we incorporate this into, you know, your daily life? The infusion time, so EV is run over 30 minutes. Sacatuzumab after the first dose is run over a bit longer, one to two hours. But that first dose, we try to monitor people. So we run it in a little slower. Dose rounding, there's some flexibility in terms of the vials that we have for each drug. And then thinking about the AE profiles, which we'll get into a little bit. So assessing patients for pre-existing conditions. So diabetes or high blood sugars, neuropathies are kind of two of the most common things. So what are the tactics for safety management for infortimab specifically? So you'll see that there are some overlapping toxicities, but there are also some very different and specific toxicities associated with the ADCs and each of these individual drugs. And if you remember back to when Brenda was talking to you about the mechanism of action, you really want to think about how this is really, you know, and talk to patients about, yes, this is a targeted agent, it's an antibody drug, but the drug, the payload that's delivered is kind of like chemotherapy, right? So a lot of the toxicities that we're going to get could be like that. But additionally, and some of the more unique toxicities are things like ocular disorders, hyperglycemia, pneumonitis, and some of the skin reactions that we see. The skin reactions tend to be things that are manageable, and they can appear in different ways. We were having a conversation about this earlier in our own experience that Brenda's noticed that she sees skin toxicities happen maybe in the folds of the skin. I've seen it on the arms, the lower legs, but these are generally pretty manageable. Peripheral neuropathy, I would say, within Fortimab is one of the bigger challenges. A lot of these patients have already seen platinum therapy, so they're coming in potentially with pre-existing neuropathy, or maybe they have a history of diabetes, and so now we're dealing with some diabetic neuropathy. Layering in the EV can really complicate or exacerbate that, and so we really pay close attention to that. I educate patients a lot about this. We talk a lot about this at every visit to try to assess neuropathy, and this a lot of times, at least in my experience, has been the driver of dose reductions and delays. So really pay attention to peripheral neuropathy with EV. Ocular disorders, some people can report kind of dry eyes, but engaging with ophthalmology, understanding what their baseline is. But if anybody's reporting blurred vision or ocular symptoms, really trying to get them in for referrals quickly and expeditiously to further assess that. Hyperglycemia. So regardless of whether someone comes in with pre-existing diabetes, hyperglycemia is a possibility with EV. So paying attention to, you know, what is their blood glucose at every visit and monitoring this closely. Generally, if the blood sugar is greater than 250, this is an indication to probably hold and manage potentially concurrently with endocrinology. And then symptoms of pneumonitis you want to watch for. So hypoxia, new cough, dyspnea, or imaging-related changes. And patients who have anything grade two or greater, and again, you can refer to the CTCAE guidelines to guide you to understand what that looks like. This is either an indication for a dose reduction or potentially holding if the patient's very symptomatic. So similar slide, but really focusing in on sacatuzumab here and the toxicity safety management for sacatuzumab. So you can see here, although there are some overlapping, I want to highlight that, you know, you remember this is an active metabolite of a renotecan that's being delivered as the payload. And so you can see similar toxicities to a renotecan. So diarrhea or cholinergic symptoms. So these are patients you want to watch very closely for those symptoms, as well as neutropenia. So it's going to affect the blood counts. Actually, both drugs can, we can see some impact on the blood count, but certainly with sacatuzumab. So sometimes these patients require GCSF support, and we want to really consider treatment 
of these febrile neutropenic patients closely. Hypersensitivity reactions can occur. And then again, other GI symptoms. This is a moderately emetogenic regimen. So we do want to pre-medicate patients with dexamethasone and other antiemetics. So this slide kind of just gives you a comparison between the two. It's really an overview of the last two slides, but highlighting kind of the differences between the two. So again, to hit home on peripheral neuropathy within fortimab, hyperglycemia, and then the rash. And it can present in different locations. Clearly, in many of our experiences, even here, we probably, the three of us have different experiences, but it's generally maculopapular, diffuse, could look like a sunburn. But steroids and antihistamines generally are the mainstay of therapy. And then with sacatuzumab, neutropenia, and diarrhea. So educating patients about a diary, talking about dietary changes that they can make to modulate the stools, and, you know, hydration if needed. So I want to shift a little bit, and we spent a lot of time talking about the trials and the approval for urtafitinib, but really as nurses, one of your roles as well is to talk with patients about the role of genomic testing. And I was surprised actually to see that, you know, I think this is probably something that we do very commonly in some of the larger academic centers because it is integrated in a lot of the trial work that we do, but biomarker testing has become very, very important in a lot of the oncology care that we deliver. And so particularly in bladder cancer, we want to think about eligibility for this FGFR inhibitor because as you saw from the trials, there's some significant benefit to this. So really at the time of metastatic diagnosis, we should be testing all of these patients. You know, the Flatiron database had analysis of, you know, over 700 patients, and it showed that fewer than half had undergone testing. And so we know from our experience that of those who tested, about 21% had the mutation, and only 42% of them actually received urtafitinib. So again, just emphasizing the value and the role of genomic testing. It's another drug opportunity for patients. There are obviously many different platforms for this, so kind of working with your team, your care team on what the appropriate platform is, but the comprehensive approaches can really shed some light on opportunities for therapeutics for these patients. So as your role as the nurses providing education to patients about this is critical. So we'll talk a little bit about ertafitinib and the side effects associated with ertafitinib. So, you know, this is the FGFR3 inhibitor, and so it really has a unique set of adverse events. So with patients, I talk a lot about oral hygiene and sort of prevention of mucositis. We talk about skin and nail changes, and then the two kind of big ones in the blue boxes down below are hyperphosphatemia. This is a unique one. And actually, if you delve a little deeper, you'll see that this drug in particular requires pretty close monitoring at the start of the therapy. So we actually check labs within 14 days, the first 14 days and then 21 days to ensure that patients' phosphate levels aren't rising. And if they are, we do dose reduce them pretty quickly. So this is something that can happen very quickly. So educating patients like you're going to need to come back as soon as you start this drug, you're going to need to come back in two weeks. We're going to be checking your labs very closely early on until we get to a steady state dose. And then additionally, ocular toxicities. You know, I have a patient I remember very vividly that this developed incredibly fast. They'd been on therapy for a while and, you know, a few months into therapy, suddenly with blurred vision, we sent him to ophthalmology and he had CSR, central serous retinopathy. So having a good established relationship with an ophthalmologist and establishing regular ophthalmic exams for your patient is critical before you start this drug. So I think any education that I would provide to the patient is really any change in your visual symptoms, you need to call and report it, and they should be immediately seen by optho. And this would be a reason to hold therapy um, potentially and discontinue if not improving. We're going to go back to Brenda. All right. We're back to Mark. And just a summary, like a recap, he has metastatic urothelial carcinoma. Again, comorbidities are diabetes, hypertension, and mild anemia. These are his labs. He starts off baseline with a grade one fatigue. And so there's a discussion about options for first line setting and first line treatment in the metastatic setting. And shared decision making is to proceed with infortimab, vidotin, and pembrolizumab. So we're going to go to the panel. And what are some things that should be emphasized to the patient? I know you just really kind of went through our channel, all the side effects and everything, but just to kind of what side effects to emphasize again, and then maybe talk a little bit about how to manage the patient expectations while they're on IO therapy, you know, with the AEs that might come, because a lot of that stuff sounds pretty scary. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So how do you approach that? 
Yeah, so, you know, you can see with Mark, he's not really officially diabetic, but his hemoglobin A1C is 6. So this is someone who's kind of borderline, who I'd be a bit worried about, that I would spend probably a lot of time talking and mentally preparing this patient, that we may end up seeing some hyperglycemia. And so let's kind of track on his blood sugars closely. And then, again, because of the EV, I would talk a lot about the peripheral neuropathy, potentially, and trying to assess what their baseline is. You know, get them to get up up and walk around and what, you know, do they have any baseline? Neur- I can't remember if he has baseline neuropathy, but I'm not sure that we talked about it, but assessing that as well up front. And then those would kind of be my, my top two. And then when we talk about immune related toxicities, I think again, emphasizing that those toxicities could happen really later. So, you know, it may be a dose or two before we start to even notice anything, but you know, with monotherapy, you know, the percentage of patients that actually receive, have some toxicity, you know, it's not insignificant. It's less than 50%, but still it's something, but generally they're mild enough that we can manage them. And so just early detection and reporting to us so that we can be aggressive in our symptom management. Wonderful. When we think about combinations, you know, oftentimes we're thinking about overlapping toxicities and you highlighted really well, I think the immune mediated rashes and also EV rashes. And it's sometimes hard to distinguish, right, which one is related to which, especially as they're getting started on combinations the same day. And so those types of things are, the treatment for them and the management are similar, right, topical steroids and then thinking about oral steroids, but really thinking through and these combinations when we give them day one, day eight and seeing them potentially more frequently than we see patients who are getting every three week pembrolizumab only, you do have more touch points and are able to assess a little bit more closely. The peripheral neuropathy, I would try in that it is more likely to be from the EV component, right? Pembrolizumab doesn't usually cause peripheral neuropathy. And a few years ago, I was working with this really brilliant med student and she was saying, hey, you know, I was in the lab and Nectin-4 is really interesting because I was working in a neurology lab and Nectin-4 is actually expressed on myelin. And so this is an on-target effect of infortimavidotin. And so we start talking early on to patients about if you have difficulty buttoning buttons or if you have difficulty holding a mug, you know, those subtle things or holding a pen, subtle things like that can clue us in early. And, you know, we may want to dose reduce. And for tamabidotin, we can dose reduce unlike pembrolizumab. So we want to hear about these types of side effects early on and as they're getting day one, day eight treatments. So we can even dose reduce the same day. And then the hyperglycemia, I do want to just mention that there is a label indication for infortimavidotin to hold if the glucose is over about 250. And for patients who do have baseline diabetes where we're watching those sugars closely and it somewhat overlaps, you know, in with checkpoint inhibition, sometimes in the very late stages of treatment, we can cause immune mediated diabetes. So certainly something that we're watching pretty closely with this particular treatment combination. And just to kind of circle back, how long do you treat patients? So if Mark was on this regimen, you know, obviously if he's progressing, that's pretty straightforward. But if he's responding, how long would you treat on this regimen? Yeah, it's a hard question because the trials are designed until treatment progression or unacceptable toxicities. And so oftentimes these patients are treated for a long time if they're tolerating treatments. I will say that peripheral neuropathy, things that kind of come on slowly but steadily. And by four to six cycles into EV, we start having difficulty with neuropathy. We may have some difficulties with rashes. And so I don't hesitate to hold a dose or skip a dose of EV if we're getting into um, toxicities that are difficult. We sometimes can continue the pembrolizumab alone for those effects. And then there are some patients who develop some colitis with the pembrolizumab too, and we're sort of limited there. So it really depends on their side effects and as they come up. But certainly around four to six cycles is where we see a spot for holding the EV, particularly as the peripheral neuropathies accumulate. If they tolerate well, really, we don't have a good stopping point. And that is an another point of shared decision making. I think how much is enough if they've achieved a complete response, right? Maybe we don't need all the treatments to be ongoing, but another point where we need to be talking with our patients. And for this very new combination, we have very limited data from phase two, and there will be a phase three that we'll read out later this year, but we really don't know how durable these complete responders are. And so having that conversation, I think, is affecting many of our frontline therapies across GU malignancy 
emergencies where we were like, hey, you've had a really deep partial response or a complete response, and maybe you might feel better when you're off treatment, but we don't know for sure how durable things will be. Hopefully, it will be quite durable with immune responses, but we don't know. And this is like for either of you, because if I'm a patient and I'm going to go on in fortimab vidotin, and how would you explain how the drug works in a way that I would be able to understand it? So, you know, I describe it as an antibody. It's a target. You know, it targets, the, you know, the surface of the cancer cell, but it actually, then once it binds, it actually delivers essentially like a chemotherapeutic drug directly into the cell. So it's considered a targeted therapy, but it still has some of the toxicity that we can see with chemotherapy. That's kind of my basic high-level explanation. Yeah, no, I think that's perfect, Archana. So oftentimes we'll hear smart bombs thrown around, or I like to think about it as truly a targeted chemotherapy, right? It has a target, and then it's delivering the chemotherapy. So then people are used to hearing about chemo, and so they're kind of looking out for more side effects. It's not without side effects, and so it's really important for these folks to keep thinking about, you know, how are things changing while they're on treatment? Are they having some early side effects? And making their care team aware. Okay, very good. Thank you. Unfortunately, just revisiting Mark, he had progression of disease. He had new liver and bowments. Now he has grade one peripheral neuropathies. He has grade two fatigue, a little bit of nausea, and he's spending more than 50% or he's resting more than 50% of the day. He does have a history of a mild cataract. And so options are discussed for this second line treatment in metastatic disease and shared decision making is he will start urtafitinib with close monitoring given his baseline symptoms and his comorbidities. So what are some things that, I know we really did talk about this a lot, but what are some things to emphasize to Mark about the side effect monitoring and reporting events? And again, given his performance status, what sort of little pearls would you share that we could help support him to be able to maintain therapy? or be on therapy. I can start. I mean, I guess the first thing I would say is, you know, now he's progressed. He's got liver and bone mets, you know, and I could see that Mark, he's a little more beat up, right? He comes in now with an ECOG of two instead of an ECOG of one. We didn't talk a lot about fatigue, but certainly fatigue comes with these therapies too, right? And so he's now has a little more fatigue. He's got some peripheral neuropathy, nausea, and you know, now has some diabetic related changes, you know, the cataract and, you know, sounds like now officially diagnosed with diabetes. So he's not a great performance status, right? He's not entering in sort of as robust as he was. But the fact that his tumor tissue showed this FGFR mutation, it's great. He's got a targeted therapy that we can start. So this is, you know, in some ways, it highlights the fact that, you know, you don't have to have an ECOG of zero to go on some of these therapies. And so, you know, again, in terms of toxicity, some of the things that we highlighted, you know, with his pre-existing now diabetes and cataract, we're going to have close collaboration with endocrinology or primary care who's managing it as well as ophthalmology, at least to start. And then Dr. Zhang, if you want to add to that. Yeah. So you highlighted very appropriately, I think, the ocular side effects. And so often on the trials, when patients were going on or to fitnib, we had ophthalmologic evaluations at baseline. So certainly somebody who already has a slight cataract, I would send them back to their ophthalmologist and say, hey, you know, we're starting on this treatment. I want you to have a baseline. And then, you know, to have your ophthalmologist on short call, basically, if they were to have any sudden onset vision changes. So I think that portion of it is very important. And then the toxicities, the phosphorus levels going up is actually what we want to see, the pharmacodynamic changes that happen when we give ertafitinib. And so when we're not seeing hyperphosphatemia, we're actually thinking about increasing drug. So it's really important important that they're being followed very closely, that they're coming back. And with this particular patient, the nail changes too. I think people don't expect those so much. There's a lot of paronychia and things with these targeted oral treatments that kind of creep on, but they're very annoying and very painful when they happen. So those types of side effects can really affect patient quality of life. Yeah, I would actually add even to that, too, the hand-foot syndrome or the rashes that can occur. There are ways to be really proactive about that. Other drugs, you know, other TKI therapies that we use in GU malignancies, you know, we use urea-based creams. So you could kind of proactively advise your patient to start utilizing that, you know, put on some urea cream, gloves, and socks at night to just really be ahead of it. So those are some of the other education points. 
The questions have been coming in, and as part of the cases, I've been trying to address some of them. But I found this one really interesting. They're all very interesting. But somebody works in a rural clinic, and any tips for counseling patients who are suspicious or anxious about health care in general about the newer range of options? So that's a pretty loaded question. You know, you don't have to be in a rural clinic to have these patients. I know, <laughs> I know, I know. We get them every day, I'm too. Sure. <laughs> and in Dallas, I, I certainly see these patients. You know, and some patients are very cognizant. They're very aware of the treatments. And it's usually an older patient population that says, hey, you know, I've lived a good life. I know where I'm going. And, you know, I know you have side of treatments, but they have a lot of side effects. And I'm just not really interested. And, you know, we don't sit well with that because we've developed all these drugs. And, gosh, we can get them to live longer, but with side effects. And so it is really, you know, asking a patient, what are your goals and how can we help you achieve those? And if they're comfortable, they understand the potential treatment options and they understand the side effect profiles and they really make that informed decision not to go on treatment. To me, it's just validating their preferences and none of us can make a patient take a pill or sit for for an IV infusion. So to me, it is really balancing that discussion and making sure sure that they understand everything that's available and making that informed decision. So what does the changing landscape look like for nurses? We know that biomarker testing, especially for EGFR receptor, is important. And it's imperative patients who have metastatic disease have that testing done. We know, listening to all of our presenters today, all the different mechanisms of action and the potential AEs that we can see prioritizing clinical trials for patients. Obviously, we educate every single day, not only ourselves sitting in this room, but our patients. And so they're going to have questions that we all have patients who don't want to ask the doctor a question. And they'll ask us this question or, you know, how does this work? Or why should I take this? Or, you know, what are the expectations? And I think having a good understanding of the clinical trials, the outcomes and the medications and the treatment options we have, you know, the mechanisms of action and the potential side effects. And then again, you know, utilizing resources from BCAN. There's organizations out there to help you kind of manage and provide information to patients. Patients can go on the website and do some searching around themselves. It's a really great resource. Brenda, if I could chime in for a moment oh, yeah. about the biomarker testing, because there's a question in here about blood-based liquid testing for FGFR alterations. So we will often, the gold standard is to send the tissue if there's a biopsy available or an archival specimen sitting around in the pathology archives, it's really gold standard to send that tissue. But if that's not available and the lesions are too small to biopsy or you're suspecting some changes based on prior treatment resistance, we are relying somewhat on circulating tumor DNA. There's a couple of assays now that are pretty standard across commercial platforms. There's a Garden 360 assay, a foundation liquid assay, and a Tempest liquid assay. And so oftentimes we're incorporating that into our work streams in clinic. Oftentimes, uh, the nurses that I work with in Dallas are really, you know, helping us with all the paperwork and there's portals and all sorts of things. But very, very important to send that peripheral blood because it's a fast and easy test. And if, when we get the result and if it's positive, you know, that 20% or so of patients can really open up another treatment strategy. Um, so certainly we rely on this partnership in clinic to make sure that these biomarker testing goes well. All right. So key takeaways. You know, I, I kind of want to circle back and just revisit some of the shortcomings that we I, I mentioned earlier on. In those who have metastatic disease, just remembering that one quarter to one half of patients currently um, do not receive any treatment for their disease. And less than half of patients who progress on first-line therapy receive second-line therapy. So I am hoping that we will change this narrative and everyone in this room has the knowledge and the power power to change the narrative so that patients are achieving the outcomes that modern therapy is capable. So with that, we're going to do audience questions and answers. And we've been trying to, again, like I said, answer questions as we go through. There's a great question that kind of dovetails, I think, on what we were talking about earlier. You know, so the question is, what tips can you give for educating patients who have low health literacy regarding immune adverse events? Many of these patients still state they're receiving chemo despite repeated education, and they often brush away many symptoms and don't report them. And I think this is 
Certainly very true, and it's a hard population to handle. But one of the things that we implemented at our site that's worked really nicely is proactive calls from our nurses. And so when we know a patient is starting on IO therapy, our nurse, we have a dedicated nurse who's kind of proactively reaching out to the patient, you know, a week after treatment or a few days after treatment or, you know, after maybe I see them, I'm concerned about something or the physician sees them, we're concerned and we'll ask our nurse to reach out proactively. And it's really kind of broken down these barriers that, you know, patients feel like, well, I'm Spanish speaking. If I try to call, I have to get an interpreter. It's too complicated. It's hard, you know, and they feel like we're not really accessible by phone, even though we are, despite the education. But I think if you have the capacity or the bandwidth within your clinic, and maybe it's just to target those particular patients, but try to do some proactive reach out to these patients mid-cycle. And you might capture a lot that you wouldn't otherwise capture. I think we talked a lot about thyroid dysfunction, but if somebody does develop some thyroid dysfunction, how would we manage that? That's like probably one of the most common AEs we see with IO. Yeah, and especially that we sometimes see an early thyroiditis and hyperthyroidism before we see hypothyroidism. Oftentimes in the early thyroiditis, early on in my practice, uh, I was very quick to pull out the methimazole and get people more treatment. But actually my, our endocrinology colleagues are less excited to give methimazole unless they're truly symptomatic from hyperthyroid. And so they will let that thyroiditis inflammation ride out if the patient's asymptomatic. And then as they become hypothyroid, replace the thyroid hormone. So I thought that was a really interesting approach and something that we've adopted as well. But if they are symptomatic, then sending them over to endocrine, maybe thinking about methimazole early is an appropriate. But most of the time, these transient thyroiditis are pretty limited, self-limited. And, you know, it's, it's something that happens a lot, right? For all the endocrinopathies that we see, thyroid dysfunction is the most common from mediated toxicities. I would put in a plug for the podcast that I have. So if any of y'all have like 10 minute intervals on your way to work, there is a Checkpoint Now MD podcast that we have different episodes on each immune mediated toxicity and gather some of the experts around the country to talk through management and what's happening with new discoveries. There's actually a recent paper out from the Farber group that's associating genetic polymorphisms with pre predisposition for immune-mediated toxicities. And so as those things come out, we're, we're adding to our, our decks. But hopefully that also gives you very targeted education pieces as things goes on. But I think advocacy groups like Beacon are great resources for our patients who are hearing about this. And then as you all help educate and manage, having anything that's really quick and accessible is to me hopefully helpful to everyone that's out there. I want to thank the panel and thank you all for coming. And I hope you enjoyed and learned from this presentation. Have a good day. Thank you for listening. Download materials and complete the post test for instant credit at peerview.com forward slash VTJ 860. This activity is supported by independent educational grants from Astellas and CGen, AstraZeneca and Janssen Biotech Incorporated, administered by Janssen Scientific Affairs, LLC.